Hello, welcome to this uh, uh, hopefully uh, short and useful uh, presentation on a few just uh, last tips for the CFA exam. So we're now getting to the very kind of, I guess, uh, mad panic part, uh, which is the exam a few weeks away. And I remember certainly feeling extremely nervous, anxious, uh, and if I'm honest, uh, a little bit scared uh, when I was in that same position that you're now in. So hopefully I can help you a little bit, uh, a, few, uh, a few tips uh, from the experience that I've had in preparing candidates for approximately 20 years for doing CFA, um, and, and my other uh, colleagues that make up the uh, CFA faculty here at Fitch Learning. Anyway, my name is Simon Hollahan, I'm the head of CFA exam training here at Fitch, uh, and hopefully uh, we can uh, uh, help you, as I said, in the next uh, few moments. Okay? So we're going to focus on just a few uh, last minute pointers. Um, as with a lot of these tips, they, they often are quite common sense, but uh, when you're in a panicky state, which many people will be, often common sense gets forgotten. Um, and so I can absolutely uh, uh, relate very much to uh, uh, that feeling, and uh, having these tips uh, I think would have helped me uh, in many, many moons ago. So we're going to look at uh, a very simple uh, structure here, um, a few kind of absolute essential uh, things you have to expect and have to uh, prepare for, and also a few kind of, uh, say, top tips in the last few weeks. Okay. Uh, before we uh, get into that, uh, a quick reminder of the exam format. And I guess probably the most important thing to bear in mind is the, uh, the no negative marking. So, you know, you really have to guess even if you don't know. You're not going to lose any marks from guessing. But apart from that, make sure you can, you're prepared for the exam. So remember, both papers are three hours. Um, it may appear from your schedule that you have a long lunch break, a, a two-hour lunch break. I can, I can tell you that tends not to be the case. Um, it depends on what centre you're going to, but uh, if you're going to a big centre, uh, then uh, the, just the, the sheer number of people there, it's going to take time for them to collect the exam papers in and dismiss you, and also take time to register you for the, the second exam. So I remember when I did my uh, Level 1 exam, we did it here in London, um, it, yeah, you had to start queuing up to register uh, a good hour before the exam started. You know, if you started to join the queue at, a, at about, say, half past eight in the morning, then you wouldn't get through. It's a bit like an airport. If you rock up too, too near the flight time, you simply don't get through security. And there will be uh, security uh, and checks in place. They'll check your ID, they'll check your calculator, they'll check your exam ticket. Um, they may well even ask uh, you to empty your pockets. I mean, they will be, there will be some checks, so they take time, particularly in a big centre where there could be several thousand people. So just bear in mind, although it looks like you've got a long break, my experience was you, you, your, your morning paper finishes about, obviously, 12 o'clock. It take, took them about 10 minutes to collect in the scripts. So by the time I walked out of that hall, it was about quarter past 12. Um, and then I had to start queuing for the afternoon paper around about one o'clock. So actually what looked like a two hour window was more like 40, 45 minutes. Yeah. So just bear that in mind. Um, so two, three hour papers, um, multiple choice, all independent. So if you have a, uh, a preferred section, you can just go straight to that section and they're all lumped by section. So all the economics questions are in the same area. Um, you don't have to do them in numerical order. Remember, they're independent, so you can do them any order you like. Okay, so just hopefully we're okay with the, the structure of the exam. Okay, so let's move on to some of the, uh, the, the tips in these last few weeks. So um, I guess number one is you've got to make sure you're all over the calculator. Um, although there won't be a huge number of calculation questions, I mean, most level one exams would be between sort of you know, 25% to maybe 30, 30 odd percent, maybe a quarter to a third, let's say, of the calculations uh, typically involve you using your calculator. Um, but that said, you know, if you need to use a calculator, then clearly you need to use your calculator. So it's important that you know all the relevant functions uh, and you can do them quickly. So these last few weeks, just identify those, those key functions. Uh, we have a list of them here. Uh, so we have the time value of money, that third row from the top. Crucially here, please make sure you remember how to clear the memory. Otherwise, uh, if you don't use a particular value in the next question, then the last value you put in will still be there. So remember, 
this third row we're talking about from the top, this third row, then we're using the, uh, the clear time value of money command, which is above the uh, FV on the far uh, right hand side. Obviously it's a yellow command, so we access that by hitting the yellow second button. So basically second and FV will clear the memory. But uh, that's, I guess, the basic one. iConvert, really, really cool uh, function. That's where you can switch between a stated or nominal rate and effective rate. I'll do a little um, uh, recap uh, in one of the examples in a moment. Data and stat, again, pretty crucial for working out things like standard deviation, uh, for example, um, uh, potentially correlation, uh, but it's mostly standard deviation. Uh, make sure you can distinguish between population, which is using Greek letters, so sigma, and sample standard deviation, which is Roman letters, so an S. Uh, but again, data and stat can save you uh, heaps of time. Yeah. The net present value on IRR. Well, IRR you can't really do other than through a financial calculator, or unless you have Excel smuggled into the exam. Um, so you have to know how to use the cash flow function. And again, like we mentioned with time value money, make sure you know how to delete what's in there first. So remember, you hit the cash flow button, the CF button, then once you've, you're into that worksheet, to clear that worksheet, you have to press second and then clear work. And the clear work button is this bottom left button here. So second, bottom left. But you have to press that once you're in the worksheet. So cash flow, then press that. So again, you know, these questions will come up all over the paper. It could be corporate finance, it could be in the quant section. Uh, maybe in the context of a bond, because obviously the IRR is equivalent to a yield. So there's lots of ways you may be uh, asked to do that. The AMORT function, I mean, classic financial reporting type question where you have to uh, account for a bond or lease liability. And as you probably know, you do that through an amortization approach. So again, please make sure you remember how to use the AMORT function. Um, now, if you forget any of these uh, functions, uh, there is a, a, a free uh, video uh, which you can uh, click on. Link is shown below if you need it. But basically, have a little checklist uh, of these um, these amort uh, these um, sorry cash flow uh, type uh, functions. Now, there are loads more functions in the calculator, but they're not really needed for CFA. So these are the main ones we have here. So I guess that's the the first the first tip is knowing those um, those functions. Okay. Tip two, um, question practice and time allocation. So as you remember, each paper is three hours and each paper has 120 questions due. So we can do the math and therefore every question uh, we have an allowance of one and a half minutes. Right? But bear in mind, you've only got three answers to read, you know, A, B, C. So generally speaking, uh, delegates, uh, when, when we chat to them about their exam experience, and certainly you know, the trainers that we've had doing the CFA ourselves, the general experience is it's not a massively time pressured exam. Okay, you can't hang around and, you know, and waste time, uh, but it's generally a, a fair allocation of time for the type of questions you're going to have to do. So you'll find that um, I'd say an average um, uh, experience is most people say they've got about 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes at the end uh, to, uh, uh, to, to to review, to go back and, and uh, change a right answer to a wrong answer. I wouldn't do that. Um, but you normally have about 15 to 30 minutes, let's say, at the end. So you, ha you do have time, but just be aware of it. You know? So in these last uh, few weeks, I dare say you are doing lots of mock exams. Obviously, Fitch Learning, we have we have loads of mock exams available, five um, full mocks. Um, so it's really important these last few weeks that you just do these papers in timed conditions. All right? You've got to get used to that. And you'll soon build up a, an innate kind of a ability to judge time. You know, that little voice will go off in your head saying, you've done more than one and a half minute. You know, so just get used to the timing. But it's generally, it's not something I'd panic over. What I used to do, I must say, is if I if I saw a question that, that on my gut instinct I thought was going to take me too long, or even if it was a very long question, and some questions, you know, the actual question itself could be uh, four, five, six lines to read. Um, so I assessed it very quickly, at a quick glance, it was going to take me too long, I'd make a guess, a complete guess, so me it was always B, a complete guess, uh, mark it in there, and then I'd make a little note on my question paper and then come back to it at the end. 
And so at the end, you've got your 15 or 20 minutes. You can go back, relax, read it carefully. Um, and I found that worked for me. Um, if I didn't do that, then I'd start reading a question, and that little voice in my head would be saying, one and a half minutes, one and a half minutes, and actually I'd rush it. Um, because you'll find some questions will take more than one and a half minutes. Um, but you've got to remind yourself there will be others that will take less. But the problem is you don't always do that in the exam. You just focus on the ones that are going to take too long, you start to panic, and you can make mistakes. So to me, I would always uh, leave that uh, to the end. But the key is don't allow yourself to drift off the timing. Don't get too, I guess the phrase is bogged down. Um, just keep an eye on the, on the timing. Uh, you can always guess and come back to it. All right? There's really no point spending five minutes, even if you get a question right, if it means that you run out of time and have to guess, let's say, two or three at the end. All right? So just keep that idea about the timing. But on the whole, tons of question practice in the last few weeks. Mock exams. You know, get used to doing questions on a whole range of topics. You know? So don't just do derivative questions or economics questions. You've got to start training your brain to, re to recall the whole curriculum. So that's where a mock exam, three hour, six hour, doesn't matter, but at least a three hour paper is absolutely vital. As a rule of thumb, it should take you longer to debrief your paper than it does to do it. All right, so for me, if I was doing a three hour paper, I'd probably want to allow four hours for a detailed debrief. Uh, and make sure that you understood why you got the answer right, why you got it wrong. Yeah, um, did you get it wrong for the right reasons? Yeah. I must say, when I was doing the exams, I found it quite useful creating a little code uh, which helped me debrief it. Because if I've done a three-hour paper and I'm now marking it, I don't remember at that when I'm marking it whether I was confident or not when I was doing question three or whatever. So I used to put a little code. I used to put, uh, if a question I was pretty confident with, I'd put a little, little tick next to it. That's my code to say, I think I've got that right. If it was a more of a 50-50, I'd put a question mark. And if it was an absolute guess, no idea, never seen it before in my life, I used to put an exclamation mark. And that really helped me when I did my debrief because Clearly, if I got an exclamation mark correct, I didn't get too carried away, didn't take the credit. If I got it wrong, I didn't get too upset. Yeah. Um, the way I focused my time is on the ticks. If I got a tick correct, fantastic. If I got a tick wrong, then that means something that I thought I was good at, I'm not. That's quite dangerous. In quants, that's a type 2 error. So, so I'd really make sure I debriefed any of those I got wrong very carefully and in full. And where I think you can add the most value is on the question marks, those 50-50s. If you can turn even half of them from 50-50 to say 70-30, then that's really the key to being successful. So maybe have a think about some sort of plan for helping you uh, when you uh, uh, debrief it. But certainly, question practice, timing, pretty vital. So here's an example of a kind of tricky question. Uh, I picked this one because on, on the face of it, it could be a time trap. But actually, it links in quite nicely to one of the uh, other um, tips in terms of the calculator. This question here is, is so easy if you use the calculator function. So all we're doing here is we are given information about a bond, and we're told that it has a yield of 3.4%. And that's on a semi-annual basis. So remember, yeah, when we quote yields, the assumption is it's quoted in a, in a, in a, in a stated way or a nominal way. Um, what that means is it's the, it's the actual return for the time period simply then multiplied by the number of time periods in a, in a year. So if it's semi-annual, that means we have the six-month return times two equals 3.4%. Uh, now, in your calculator, the stated uh, rate is, is called the nominal rate, or NOM. You know? So we can use the iConvert function, that really important function. It's a, a, a yellow command above the number 2, so press the yellow second button and the number 2, um, and we can access the iConvert button. It helps if I turn mine on first. Anyway. Okay, so let's do this, shall we? Um, it's really simple if you know that iConvert fun function. So let's type in the, uh, the nominal rate given to us. Okay, so 
3.404. Okay. I'll see you hit the enter command at the very top and a down arrow. Okay. And what we're going to do first of all is we're going to take that effective rate on a semi annual basis. Uh, so take the nominal rate, sorry, on a semi annual basis. Okay. So nominal on a semi annual. Work out what that is equivalent on a compound annual basis, what's called the effective basis, and then recalculate what that's worth on a normal basis but using a different uh, frequency of cash flows, a different periodicity, as a CFA call it. Right? So we're going to go from semi annual, so where we have two cash flows in the year, to monthly, where clearly we're going to have 12 cash flows in the year. But the point is, the effective rate, that is the tr proper, true compound rate. So if you were making, whatever, say 1% in over six months, then over the year, you're making 1% on 1%. And that's the actual true return. So if I type in the 3.404 as a nominal, hit the down arrow a couple of times to where it says cash flows per period, per year, type in 2, enter, Go back up to the effective rate and hit compute, and we'll see the uh, we get a figure of roughly 3.43, let's say 3%. Once we've got that, we can then say, okay, now let's hold that number there and let's recalculate what a stated or nominal rate would be using 12 periods a year. So again, hit the down arrow where it says cash flows per year, type in 12, enter, and go back up to where it says nominal and hit compute. So we get an answer here of 3.38-ish percent. So the, uh, the nearest answer is A. So if you try and do this using a kind of a formula approach, which you can do, it's actually it will take a bit of time. On that iConvert function, this question, that's quite a hard question, becomes a very easy question and a very quick question. So saying that iConvert function is one of my personal favorites. I love it. It's so good. It, I think it's so intuitive. But, uh, so that's one type of uh, question there, which looks like a tricky one, but uh, if you know the functions, it isn't. Okay. Um, cash flow, another type of question. So before we do the question, we've got a quick reminder of um, classifications, because this always comes up. I know we shouldn't talk about the exam, but uh, it's a very, very big area in terms of cash flow classification and contrasting uh, US GAAP with IFRS GAAP. Right? So this is not comprehensive, the slide clearly, but these are the key differences in terms of interest and dividends. Right? So as a quick uh, reminder, um, so for US GAAP, interest paid uh, has to be classified as an operating cash flow, so CFO. Uh, interest received has to be operating, CFO. Dividends paid, however, must be financing, or CFF. Yeah? Um, dividends received must be CFO, operating. So US GAAP gives you uh, no, no flexibilities. It's very, very um, rule-based, you know, very clear rules that say this goes here. IFRS as a whole uh, generally allows a bit more choice. Uh, whether you think that's good or not is irrelevant, but it's a bit more choice. Uh, so they start off by saying, look, if you want to, you can do exactly the same as US GAAP. Yeah, and many, uh, certainly many European companies, actually, when you look at their accounts, look a lot like US GAAP. Because IFRS often allows you, where there's a choice, say, look, if you want to, you can do like US GAAP. So those kind of, you know, transatlantic companies, you know, the BPs, the, the Vodafones of the world, you tend to find, although they're IFRS, they look and feel like US GAAP, right? So they say, if you want to, copy US GAAP. So we can fill that in here, copy US GAAP. Or we can change it. And, you know, the thing about IFRS is they, they say you can change it, but you have to still be consistent in how you change it. So what I mean by that is take interest paid and dividends paid. You can argue that what's the difference there? In both cases, we've raised capital and we're now servicing that capital. So IFRS says in that case, put them both in the same section. So if you want to, if you're going to leave interest paid in CFO, then dividends paid should go into CFO. Or if you're going to leave dividends paid into CFF, interest paid should be CFF. So you can see here you have to be consistent between those two. 
And the same thing applies to uh, income you receive on investments. Uh, you could leave them where they are, both CFO, or you could put them into CFI, which to me probably makes more sense. These are incomes on an investment. But anyway, it's up to you, but be consistent there. Okay, so a quick recap there. Let's have a look at a quick question to get the idea of uh, these uh, exam questions. Uh, you're, you're almost certainly going to see this type of question here. It's using um, uh, basic accounting information, and here we're asked to uh, work out the cash flow from financing. Now, it's really common in, in all levels of the CFA that you'll get more information than you need. And so half of the, the technique here is obviously to identify what you're asked for. So if it was me, I'd be writing here a very quick CFF. I'd make it very clear that I know what I'm targeting. And I'd then be trying to highlight what I need and either ignore or delete what I don't. So we've just gone through uh, the classifications. We can, we're told here it's US GAAP. So that makes things a lot easier, doesn't it? So US GAAP for CFF, what are we looking at? We're saying, OK, dividends paid, definitely going to be there. So we have dividends paid, so I'm definitely going to have the 60. Um, but obviously, uh, if I issue, if I raise finance, if I issue a bond or issue shares, if I raise finance, that will have to be CFF. So here I'm, I'm issuing some uh, common stock. So that's definitely going to be CFF. And I'm issuing a bond. There we are. Anything else? Equipment being purchased? Nope. That would, if I was asked, be going through CFI. Nothing to do with CFF. Um, fixed assets were sold. Well, OK, that would also be going through CFI, not CFF. And all the rest of the uh, stuff down below is all relating to our, our operations. So it's kind of comes through CFO. So, so none of that is needed. So the 100 isn't needed. The 60 isn't needed. So I've got the bits highlighted. So typical exam technique, ditch what you don't need, focus on the key question, and then just plug it together. So OK, I'm spending 60 on dividends. That's an outflow, minus 60. I'm getting in 40 from issuing shares and getting in 160 from issuing bonds. So if I, if I net all those off, so minus 60 plus 40 plus 160, um, I should get a, a positive number of 140. Yeah. So, you know, a quick example of a couple of questions there. Um, but, you know, please, you know, think about those calculator shortcuts. You know, if it's a really complicated question, it probably is a shortcut on your calculator. And just watch out for redundant or unnecessary information. You know, do not think you have to use all the information. And I can tell you now, if you're going to do this journey through CFA, the, the higher the level you go, the more irrelevant the information is. So when you get to, uh, like, level three, you might have a two, three-page case study and six questions based on it. But of those two or three pages, the information you need could probably be done in half a page. Yeah, so it's a common theme that you'll find. OK, uh, next tip. Uh, make sure you know how a topic will be tested. All right? um, sounds obvious, I know, but it actually isn't that obvious. Uh, you can lose sight uh, of um, the precise uh, uh, focus of the exam, particularly for those of you who might be looking at the CFA Institute uh, books, the e-book, for example. Although they have the losses at the beginning of each reading, they're not embedded in the text. So you end up th you know, reading something which may be a, a very, very calculation-based kind of bit of writing, and you start assuming that you'll have to do a calculation. All right? And so you, you've got to think, OK, but what was the learning outcome statement saying? Those of you who are using, obviously, Fitch uh, learning uh, material, then obviously we will embed those uh, learning outcome statements on every single slide. So you won't have that mistake. But if you're using the uh, CF Institute, just keep going back to the losses. You know, keep going with the losses and think about, OK, is it saying describe? Is it saying explain? Okay. Some of the best ways, uh, and I think probably a, a really underutilized resource, but some of the best ways of dealing with this issue is the CFA end of reading questions. Right? They are quite varied in style, so they're clearly written by several different authors, which is good. 
but also they, they, they are the author's opinion of how that topic can be tested. Now, although the authors are not the same people who write the CFA exam, they are very separate people, but clearly, I guess, the exam writers they, they wouldn't be human if they didn't look at those questions as inspiration. I think, okay, well, that's what the delegates know, that's what they are expecting. It's probably not going to be fair if we give them a question that's miles different. So I think for uh, tip number three, it's really my advice is to go to the CFA curriculum and go to the end of reading questions. And that will give you a really good feel as to how it may be tested, along with obviously reading the learning outcome statement. And that links on nicely to the, uh, the next top tip, you know, the learning uh, outcome statements. Yeah, it's really important that you focus very much on what's called the command words, like describe, explain, etc. But, there's always a but, um, you've got to be quite careful in not to interpret the uh, losses too narrowly. Uh, you have to interpret them in the context of the information they relate to. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, the laws may say, describe duration. Now, duration, as we know, is a highly numerical concept. So I don't know about you, but I don't know if I could describe duration without using numbers. I mean, how, you know, the basic definition, isn't it? If, if yields go up by 1%, the price goes down by X percent. X is duration. Well, they are, I've used numbers. Uh, and you could argue, well, that's getting quite close to a calculation. Yeah. And so, all I'd say is don't be too narrow. Generally, the command words are very good, but you have to interpret them in the context of the information. So imagine the loss was explain uh, the impact of duration on a portfolio. Now, I'm making up that loss, but as an example, explain the impact of duration on a portfolio. I don't know how you could deal with that without numbers, quite frankly. So, so please you know, look at the command words, but in the context of the information. Um, now, in that context, you'll find lots and lots of kind of, I guess, redundant, or it's not redundant, background, perhaps is a better word, information in the curriculum. Uh, and it, there may well be lots of formally. But again, go back to the laws. Is the laws suggesting, or are the end of reading questions suggesting that you should learn the formally? So there are quite a few formally in the curriculum. You don't need all of them. So here are the main ones we have here. So obviously, uh, standard deviation, uh, two ways, remember, population and sample. Um, standard error when it comes to uh, sampling and hypothesis testing. So that's obviously standard deviation over square root of, of n. Uh, Sharp, Trainer, Jensen, classic type questions. Um, uh, correlation, beta, covariance. Uh, this is not comprehensive, by the way. There's other things like coefficient of variation we haven't got there. Um, duration I mentioned, so make sure you're all over that. So Macaulay modified. Um, effective, etc., uh, etc. Et um, Cap M, yeah, you got to expect Cap M. Except I won't read it all out, but these are these are some of the most important. As a minimum, you should be thinking, right? I need to be able to do these, recall these, uh, uh, um, and, and try and do some questions on them. So really important to learn some of these uh, uh, key key for me. Next tip: um, don't just focus on your favorite topics. Um, it's easily done, but bear in mind in these last few precious days you want to focus where you can add the most value. Right? So don't just do areas that you're strong on because okay they will stay strong, fine, but they'll probably stay strong regardless of what you do. Equally don't just work on your very weak areas because they will take a disproportionate amount of your time to crack. So if I'm honest that the area you can add the most value is actually those 50-50s. That's what I said earlier, that if you can mark your mocks as you're doing them, you know, were you confident, was it a little bit of a guess, or was it a complete guess? It's those 50-50s, those question marks, is where actually you can really add the value. Right? So the weak areas, yes, don't ignore them completely, but don't over-focus. The strong areas, you'll do some anyway in doing mocks, but don't, don't do tons of questions on an area that you always score well on. It's those 50-50 areas, I think, is where you should uh, spend most time on. Right? Number six, um, know the curriculum weightings. We're going pretty important, clearly. Uh, um, hopefully you remember those. We have a, a slide here showing those weightings. So um, FRA is the biggest weighting. Yeah. But although that's obviously very important, 
I guess for most candidates, the most important one is ethics. Not, be, not only because it's a, a decent weighting, you know, 15%, but as you probably know, if you are borderline, then the CF Institute will purely look at your ethics score. All right, so nothing else will count apart from ethics. So if you're borderline and you scored, say, over 70, congratulations, you're through, you get a nice email that says, congratulations, and off he, off he goes. If unfortunately you don't do well in ethics, then you get the other email, which is not so nice to read. So ethics is really, really important. And, and I reckon many people, many of you out there, will end up being borderline, because I simply don't think there's that many people who clear the bar easily. I certainly didn't. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you, the level one exam I found quite challenging. You know, just the, the breadth of it. Uh, I can absolutely guarantee I was not getting 90 odd percent. Yeah, uh, and I think that's true of most people who take the exam. You know, those who've done no work don't turn up. And so I think the, the range of marks is going to be pretty tight. I reckon a standard deviation, I'd love to know what it is, I reckon it's pretty small. So I reckon many, many people are going to be really close to that passing score. So ethics is really important. And it's funny, whenever I speak to one of our, our, our delegates who perhaps um, has not passed, and I, I look at the breakdown that they give you of your topic uh, scores, it's really, really rare to find someone who didn't pass, but who got 70% or above in ethics. It's almost uniform. Didn't pass, you didn't get 70% in ethics. You know, so it's really rare that someone's aced ethics but then didn't pass. So, so really important you focus on, on ethics. It's, it's, it's a vital 15%, but also it's vital if you are uh, borderline. Right? So uh, please make sure you find time. Uh, I must say the CFA Institute reading is super here. If you haven't looked at it, there are some cracking little scenarios after every standard. It's just a small paragraph, but they really help you nail that standard and understand, has it been violated, hasn't it? Really, really top quality uh, resource. So strongly re recommend you look at the Institute reading uh, for that, okay. Next tip, um, well, here we are, don't underestimate ethics. So uh, make sure you find uh, time. Uh, do lots of questions. Um, yeah, just try and, and uh, don't try and rote learn, is what I'm trying to say. Um, try and understand ethics. Um, the questions, will not be black and white, uh, there'll be shades of grey. So the more you can kind of step back and just pause and think, okay, well, do I understand why that rule is? Or, uh, that would really help you, right? But um, ethics is very important. Uh, people often leave it to, to, too late and they try and cram it. Okay, some people have a fantastic short-term memory. Uh, I don't, um, and I think uh, those who cram, some people it works, some it doesn't. So just try and uh, build some time, maybe the next few, next last few weeks, just say, right, I'm going to spend one day a week on ethics. And that will just kind of get well, half a day. Just, that will just keep that going. Okay. Don't overlook the CFA curriculum. Well, I've hopefully flagged that by now. Um, although clearly you're not going to read the curriculum in, in the time available, the questions, as I said earlier, are really, really useful. They're really useful. Uh, they're useful for two things. As you probably know, the questions define the curriculum along with the learning outcome statements. So even if the learning outcome statement says describe X, if at the end of the reading there's a calculation on X, then you've got to expect a calculation. So, so they're really useful helping you to understand how a topic is going to be tested. Um, but also, I guess the main thing is they are written by a whole variety of different authors. You know, most of your readings are written by at least two authors. The CFA as a principle try and marry up a practitioner with an academic. Sometimes there's more than two, but there's at least two in pretty much every uh, reading. And so you've always got at least two authors in those readings. And those authors are different for different readings. So if you look at those questions, you're looking at questions written by, I don't know, maybe 20 or so different authors. And that's the key. Variety is the key. Um, yeah, you want to have questions written by different people, who have different assumptions, who have different styles of writing, and that will make you kind of adapt, because on the day, you want to see questions you've never seen before. You know, there'll be a slightly different style to the question that you may have seen in another, you know, like Schweizer's mocks, our mocks. You know, as a human being, you cannot avoid your own style coming through. 
So the more variety you have, the more you react to that and adapt to it. So really important that you look at those, um, those questions. Practical aspects. So if you haven't done so by now, uh, print off your exam ticket. Keep it uh, safe. Maybe put it with your passport. Uh, find some pencils. Um, if you need to, uh, you get a, a sharpener there or get a self-propelling pencil, uh, an eraser. Um, you know, keep, have a little, little area of all your key aspect, key stationery. Right? Um, check the rules. Uh, I know it sounds obvious, but um, I've done lots of exams in my time. I'm sure you have as well. Um, I haven't actually done an exam that was so rigorously uh, uh, policed by the proctors. Um, so yeah, every year, unfortunately, some candidates get their result made invalid because of fairly minor, you may think, but still breaches of exam rules. Right. The most common one is uh, bringing a cell phone into the centre. The rules are very clear. You cannot have a cell phone on your body in the exam room. And everyone says, oh, but it's turned off. It doesn't matter. The rule is very clear, no cell phones. So please, please have a read of the rules uh, and, and please follow them exactly to the letter would be my advice. So, so have, a, have a read of those. But, but also other practicalities. Um, if you haven't been to the centre before, go for a dummy run. You know, make sure you know the route. You know, do you know where to park? If you're using public transport, you know, have you checked out the times? Uh, so you, I know it's obvious, but you'd be amazed how many people come the day and they suddenly think, oh, I don't know where to go. So you know, maybe the weekend before, go for a little drive or go for a little explore. But uh, be prepared. Okay? Um, keep your energy levels up. It's probably the most important thing. Um, in the last few days, there's a temptation to, to really burn the midnight oil. And you know, do long days. You know, you know, do you know, ten, fifteen hours of, of revising. You know, every day. Uh, that just means on the exam day you will be absolutely uh, very tired. Uh, is probably the polite way of saying it. Um, so try not to overdo it. You know, be reasonable. You know, you know, don't don't start too early. Don't finish too late. You know, but try and keep your energy levels um, up for these last few days. And also on the exam day itself. You know, really important you, you keep your energy up for that. So, you know, I know I sound like your dad here now, but take some healthy snacks for lunchtime. You know, banana, nuts, all these kind of uh, slow release foods are really good. Stay, stay hydrated. That can be tricky because you're not allowed drinks on your exam desk. Right? But every exam centre will have a, a water area, water fountain. All right? So use your time. Remember I said you will have some spare time. And I think if you sacrifice three or four minutes to go and have a drink, you'll, you'll absolutely benefit from your improved performance by not being dehydrated, and that will outweigh any lost time. So please make sure uh, you stay hydrated uh, on the big day. Well, hopefully these uh, tips have been uh, useful. Um, obviously, if all else fails, just pick B. That was my other strategy. That wasn't one of our top tips, though, but uh, that was one of mine. Um, if you want any further kind of uh, help or guidance, um, please contact our local officers. Um, you may well find uh, some uh, uh, extra uh, classes are running. Uh, you can find some extra resources like uh, mock exams. You know you can um, access those. So there's still time if you need extra help. Uh, please do uh, reach out and contact us. Uh, contact details on the next slide. Um, obviously, check the. Uh, uh, the website is also for more details, but we do still have some time where we can help you. Uh, so whether it's a, a mock exam, whether it's a review course, uh, please um, contact us and uh, hopefully we can help you just get over the bar for the next two, two or three weeks. Well, thank you for listening and hopefully it was useful.